Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 79, our reflections over 2021. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. Today we're just going to have a little chat about our reflections on 2021, what we've learned and everything that you guys have, have fed back to us over the last year. All that and more. See you on the inside. Happy Christmas, European DJ. How are you, buddy? Hey, EMF. Um, well, you know, actually, honestly, not not so positively because uh, we just learned yesterday that our friend and colleague, Mr. Dividend Dane, uh, unfortunately passed away. Um, yes, I think done two shows with us not too long ago in September. He came to explain everything around real real estate investment trusts how they work, how you analyze them, you know, so it's really shocked to me. Uh, we know he lived on his own um, uh, as well. And yeah, just the thoughts that um, there was no one around him. Uh, it's not really, really making me positive, specifically not before Christmas, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's a tough, it's a tough time. And we were all shocked and saddened because Dividend Dane has become a friend of ours. We've had him on the show. We we, we talk r- quite regularly on Twitter. We have a Dividend Day group, and he was a big influence when we were starting. We were trying to start a new venture, uh, the European Investor Network, and he was he was heavily involved in that. I I always try to look at at positives because it's it's a sad time and and there are sad circumstances. We know everybody will 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 meet this fate at some time, but. At the same time, dividend investing has given me the opportunity to meet somebody like Dividend Dane, who lives hundreds of miles away in in Denmark. Uh, so I, I'm thankful that we shared a passion. I'm thankful that we had time together. That we we shared a beer virtually, may I add, but we still shared a beer together. Um, and uh, the knowledge that that is passed on. So I mean, it's it's a very sad time, but I, I'm still very very thankful I, I've got to meet somebody somebody like him. But we'll 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 move on because uh, that's quite quite somber and look our thoughts go out to dividend day and the family. But we have a we have a whole show here about dividend investing, so we'll we'll try and we'll try and stay a little bit more upbeat. So we, we might talk about so we're gonna reflect over the year and we've had so, so much happen. I mean, it, it's hard to even when, when I when I started looking back, I can't believe how much we, we fit in. We, I suppose we do record weekly, so that helps but there's been so much much news over the year dominated probably by our friend COVID. it's been it's been a it's been a hell of a year I, I honestly i thought at the end of last year we would not be sitting here right now reflecting over COVID. i thought once we get the, the injections the vaccine, and vaccines yeah. we're, 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 we're done and dusted we're over the hill but that's not the case no, but I think it's uh, it's still a miracle what science has offered us, right? The production of these uh, vaccines. I know there are many anti-vaxxers that doubt, like, how can this be done so quickly, right? Well, I know a thing or two about it. And just think about like this. Usually when you're producing a vaccine, you do it with limited resources, maybe one, two scientists, maybe a few more. Um, you need to go through long approval cycles and everything. You test on animals and such. Now imagine here, almost 9 billion people were trying to find a solution. I mean, with the power and the knowledge and then the willingness of governmental bodies as well to save this issue, it's no wonder that we can do it so quickly. And secondly, the technology that was being used was already available. It was just not um, commercialized yet in such a way as it is now. So um, I think we have here really the the luck of the investments of, of the pharmacy over many, many years into mRNA and then the ability from the from the governmental bodies to, to wrap it up and speed up the processes and everything while still doing scientific due diligence, right? Let's be clear, there's been really thoroughly tested here. 
is for me just amazing. It's a miracle how much we can do as a planet. And it actually <laughs> makes me also a little bit more optimistic about what we can do with climate change still. Because I think for many of these things, the technologies are ready. It's just the, the system, how it's working, the willingness. So for me, uh, that these vaccines came was really liberating, I think. And specifically for me in the summer, I really felt free again. I know we're back in this shit again with Omicron. The boosters are coming up. It's still being tough, but imagine how life would have looked like without vaccines, right? In 2021, we would have been far worse off. So it, it's for me, it's been a miracle, these uh, vaccine productions and everything. Hmm. Yeah, and it, it's, I mean, it's still, it's still an absolute crazy time, place to go down to lockdown. So hopefully, hopefully this time next year, we yeah. will not have, have spoke we don't we won't have the need to speak well i don't think so i think we will still have it a lot and but there's a good thing yeah i studied the spanish flu a little bit you can even go to the black death and everything but every virus wanes out over time and the simple reason is that the virus doesn't want to kill the host so over time it is normal that that viruses become less severe and we see this with omicron as well so I think we might uh, uh, still see, I don't know, five to ten uh, shots uh, of vaccines coming up in the upcoming years. Um, but I hope that in five years from now, it will be rather like an uh, anti-flu shot, uh, mm. something like that. So it yeah. should it should become less severe. I just want to travel. That's 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 all I want to do. I, well, mean, I think we should be able next year. Know, that's all I want. Yeah. Let's go for that. <laughs> we had energy re. Uh, prices as well which is which is big in the news um i might speak a little bit about it later but energy was dead in 2020 and oh yes it, you know so it was uh, uh, it was a good year to be invested in in oil and gas and, and energy in general yeah and it is funny right because i was already heavily in oil and gas going into the pandemic last yeah. year and I still took the opportunity to to buy some uh, Royal Dutch Shell last year uh, mm. and, and, and do some option trading around it. And this year has been really the comeback, right? Yeah. And if people talk about inflation hedges, uh, who do you think that the winners are of the current energy prices? I mean, in the Netherlands, as an example, some prices went triple on energy wow. this year. Wow. Um, energy supplying firms, uh, or let's say that have the contracts with the consumers, are going bankrupt, like in the UK. But hey, who's big in natural uh, uh, NLG, right? Liquid gas. It's yeah. Royal Dutch Shell. Yeah. And look at the dividends that they've been hiking, the cash flows that are coming in, the buyback programs. So if you want an inflation hedge, like Shell, Total Energies, Akinor, if you want to look at the European companies, BP. Uh, actually, BP is probably even the most oil-related, but let's say uh, gas-related. I mean, that, that, that's your inflation hedge. Yeah, even more than Bitcoin. <laughs> I I don't know. Bitcoin is Bitcoin is the holy grail. <laughs> yes, sir. exactly, exactly. Uh, you obviously mentioned inflation. Inflation was was a huge talking point this year. It it, it increased sharply. Spooked a lot of investors. We had a little bit of a mini correction and, and what have you. But I think it's it's probably safe to say that that's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, yeah. I, I think I read was it last week. I, I can't remember. Uh, it's, everything just seems to be rolling to one, but it uh, was that they had the largest single day spike in inflation or something yeah. in the US um, last week. So it's it's something that's probably going to continue into at least quarter one of 2022. Um, I know I know they're talking in in Europe. They're talking about how that will come down. They're, they're, they're working to keep it down low. But yeah. it, it's, it's certainly something that investors get really spooked about it has a huge impact uh, we mentioned we, we had an episode about mortgages yeah. that have a, a huge impact on, on me personally with in terms of how i transition my investments so it's it's something to keep keep a close eye on i think over the next year yeah and, and you know there's not really an alternative for us right because interest rates are still really low so yeah. what do you do it's like it's it, i have a feeling that the next year we will be hitting a crossroad where choices need to be made specifically by governments right like if inflation keeps rising what what will we do will we stop printing money and what what does that do will it increase interest rates will that then lower the value of our stocks i think we, we're hitting a crossroad unless someone pulls a rabbit out of a head 
But they've been printing money all through this pandemic, so why stop yeah. now? Yeah, exactly. I, I somehow um, uh, they continue to find a way to forward the bill to the next generation. So I, I don't underestimate their um, cleverness and creativity in this. So yeah, but at, at some point, some generation is going to have to suffer. And, and... yeah, yeah, but may, yeah, but I'm thinking they'll wait for six, seven years. <laughs> so that's that's already half a generation almost, right? Yeah. So yeah. so keep pushing, keep pushing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and I suppose the, the last news that kind of sticks out for me is the spinning off of all these companies now that yeah. we, we are seeing. We, we've General Electric, AT&T, Unilever spoke about it. Mm, yeah. um, your favorite company, IBM, Johnson & Johnson. Um, Intel recently as well. Yeah. So the, lots, lots of companies seem to be spinning off, uh, going back, I suppose going back to their core, maybe before diversification used to be the key and they used to try and get across many different markets but it seems to be right now they might realize that they're spread too thin maybe they can't yeah. focus as much as they thought they could and they're getting back to their roots and spinning off other parts of the yeah companies. and that's one but some companies they just heavily overpaid over in the last 10 years yeah so like if you think about uh, intel for instance but also general electric with alstom uh, acquisition the french yeah. uh, energy supplier it's um it's amazing we all saw it at the time and i think a lot behind it is also opportunistic management just ceos with a too large uh well you know what um feeling that they need to make an everlasting impact on a historical company but actually way overpaying for mediocre assets right I'm sometimes wondering that nobody of them ever listened to a YouTube video of Warren Buffett, uh, where he mentioned like price is what you pay, value is what you get. It's unbelievable, and 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 that's why I have I have some mixed feelings with it because, you know, these were iconic companies, yeah, and they were all their their ancestors, they were famous for their innovation mindset, right, and acquisitions is is oftentimes also um, a poor sign of, of of lack of innovation capabilities right yeah. and and for instance what microsoft has done they saw slack coming up they they create teams yeah um, mm. here and and this for me sh shows way more of a better uh, profile and I, I read the other day also research about uh, real great companies they have the spin wheel effect right uh, i think it's from jim collins also good to great and people that invest a lot in innovation and have an ability to to market the outcome of that innovation those are usually the true winners and it's more mm. in the culture and the dna and this is what i'm missing with a lot of those iconic companies that have these ivy league uh, ceos at the moment from a certain generation that think like mbas look at the excel sheets and then just plug some things and then have really unrealistic assumptions yeah and we we know on the low level that when you estimate a project like that, you get screwed, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I mean, all, all these companies, what do they have in common? They're, they're all really mature companies, been around for decades, probably performing at the top for a very, very long time. Yeah. It is hard to sustain that. It is very hard to sustain that consistently. And, and you mentioned Microsoft, and I think Microsoft is a, yeah. a good example because they went through 10 years of Deadwood. They went yeah. through 10 years of, of not innovating. Stupid not acquisitions. Exactly. Nokia and such. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then they came back and they were able to, as you say, innovate, get them, innovate and come yeah. back. So it doesn't mean these companies can't do that. At the time, maybe the only option for them or the only option they could see those CEOs was, okay, we need to, we need to keep growing. We need to keep our investors happy. We need to make acquisitions. We're not going to innovate fast enough. They might... They might go back yeah. on that. AT&T, for example, might might now realize, okay, we, we we made huge mistakes. We tried to get involved in areas we have no business getting involved in. Let's get back to telecommunications. Let's try and progress that. And well, you're an optimistic optimist here, but I don't, for instance, in the case of AT&T, I, I think they have the wrong CEO. Look at uh, the CEO from T-Mobile at the time, uh, John Legere. Yes, yes. Yeah? What did he do? He came in with his hoodie and said, we are going to excite customers. And they've been innovating about customer centricity mm -hmm. continuously. And they grew market share like 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 a Ferrari. Yeah. And 
look look at where the company got to and then they started uh, selling themselves or merging with was it with the other company in the us but that's a great show of of what innovation means and so i see it more connected to the ceo rather than the company at the moment i think the ceos have really one of the largest influences in this yeah and we as shareholders usually don't have a lot of influence on the selection of ceos right you need to have board seats for this and um yeah i i see just as a general incompetence when 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 these companies are spinning off um i think johnson johnson here is proactive they just see like it's that would We'll, 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 we'll do it otherwise, right? <laughs> we'll spin them off already before shit hits the fan. <laughs> yes. But we cannot say that Johnson & Johnson have been stupid acquisitions, right? Um, here. No, so. no. No, not, not at all. Intel is probably another one that, that is more to your point. They, they now yeah. have a CEO that is going to promote innovation. Exactly. He, he's looking for, he's looking to open source. He's trying to get people in, yeah. in the door. Get people back to Intel, and he's so, building his own factories. Yeah, yeah. not not buying uh, poor performing af- uh, assets, thinking he can make them better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, and he's playing catch up, so he has a, he's a yeah. long road ahead of him. But yeah. that's that's what he's doing, and there's no reason why AT and T can't do that. Yes, they probably need to change their their CEO, but yeah. I'm sure the board are, are they are looking. They, they they can see what's happening to share price. I'm sure. That inv- someone's that, asking questions there uh, yeah, yeah that that affects their pocket Let, let's be honest yeah. board members uh, yeah. that's what they're looking at they, when you see a, a share price that, tanking they're going to look at the ceo they're going to say okay yeah. you're not performing and that's when they might change they, and they might look to the peer they will look to team over and say okay what have they done well we need to have more dividend investors in the board of at&t because then they would have asked the questions like before the share price started tanking <laughs> 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 I mean, pa- part of their part of their problem was they 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 wanted to keep this aristocrat status and was increasing the dividend. Yeah. And, and maybe I mean, maybe I mean, you're right. I say that's a small part of their problem. It's, it's exactly <laughs> it's a small part. <laughs> so maybe they didn't need dividend investors. Maybe they just needed yeah. someone with a bit of sense. Good. But so hey, maybe yeah. That's just that's just that's just the news the news that we reflect on. I know we have some reflections then of ourselves and maybe what we've learned or our key reflections of the year what what was I, I don't know if you have a top three but what was one of your reflections over the past year so you know uh my my biggest reflection was that there are always some stocks attractively priced yeah um i get a lot of social media interaction where people are you know not, not knowing what to buy because everything is so expensive and lots of things are expensive but I have found that there are always one or two stocks that I'm willing to buy. And you mm-hmm. know, when you think about it, there are probably more than five thousand stocks in the U.S., probably two, three thousand stocks in the in Europe. There is something. For instance, most recently I've been buying Bristol Myers, right, in Q3, Q4. Uh, for me, very attractively priced. There's always some narrative around why it's lower because of their pipeline, and this is where you need to do your own homework, build a build an understanding around their pipeline and i feel confident about it right so yes yeah. it became like uh, we are not like kids in the candy store at the moment it's rather like a needle in a haystack but i think the five or six years of research that i've been doing allow me to easier now look into my collection of, of stocks that i find interesting to quickly spot uh, the needles right so i've reduced the haystack let's say um and this is one of the reflections because also in my mind and I might even articulate like that, like, oh, it's so expensive. It's so expensive. But then my second thought comes in thinking like, but there's always a stock that I, I can buy. So. Yeah. Good. I, I think that that is important because when you look at, at the market right now, and sometimes, I mean, valuation is, is quite hard. And we, we spoke yeah. that you can make a valuation like we did on Microsoft and it could change within three or four exactly. months. But, uh, but at yeah. At the same time, there's always something there to invest in. And if you can't pick a single company, there's always an index or something that's that's trading exactly. at a, a discount. So there's always there's always investment opportunities. You just got to keep an open mind. Yeah. And part of that is, is part of my own reflections this year is in that there is lots of different ways to invest your money. And we've had some incredible guests on the show, mm-hmm. both dividend perspective and non-dividend perspective, because yeah. we like to give our listeners the opportunity, not just... I know we're sort of pigeonholed in, in dividend investing, but there is 
lots of other ways and we've seen some we do our portfolio review and we've seen some incredible portfolios where it's nicely balanced between dividend yeah. and growth if you were to look on on twitter last year dividend investing was dead this year it's it's back but you gotta you gotta strike a balance and a lot of that is shaped in how i look for companies i started to, I, when i was solely focused on just dividend i had a, a set yield for example i kind of ignored other parts now yield is is important but it's not it's not a bigger biggest factor i have no problem going for a lower yield like microsoft uh, it has higher growth fundamentals yeah and actually listening to some of these guys like the wolf how they analyze companies helps me analyze dividend companies better so yeah. i just think i think it's important to know that there's there's there is other ways to make money there is other ways to invest but it's also important to have your own plan because it's easy it's easy if you're looking on on twitter uh these yeah. growth stocks i need to buy these I need to buy these and like you buy the new shiny thing i would just say be aware that there's other options out there just stick to your own plan and just bring little bits in to improve your own own investing i think what you say is so relevant right because my plan has helped me in times that i didn't know what to do when mm. when for instance last year of the pandemic the plan has helped me actually as a as a as a as a navigation like a google maps like okay yeah. now do this now do this keep your head cool i think that is really hard without a plan because then the daily narrative will start to, yes. to fuck up your mind yeah and, and you know that that links into my second learning and th and that was know what you want and why you want it and in particular, this was oil and gas was was a great was a great example. I've mentioned it previously. Oil and gas was dead. Everybody sell shell. They cut a dividend. They're done. They're dusted. But what what do we like? We only have to look at history. What do we know about oil and gas? It's very. It goes in cycles. Boom and bust. Yeah. We, we know this, right? Every investor knows this, and you're to, you're told if you read an if you read an investment book, you should buy these at the bust. That's what you're told. Exactly. Yeah. What I saw was panic, 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 and everybody selling at this point. Yeah. Rather than the opposite, oil is dead. There's articles, um, peak oil is suddenly ahead of us. That, that was one article on, on Bloomberg. I had a huge head. And I mean, if you if you opened up the link, it just strikes you, just strikes fear into investors. And I believe it was really important to understand what was happening. We're in the middle of a pandemic, travel was closed oil and gas 100 was going to there was not even cars driving on the street we were locked in exactly houses. exactly so i just think it was really important to know what you own understand where you own it and own it and i, th I exactly. think we, we've both seen the rewards for that and i think that's a really really important lesson on the flip side of that do not mistake that for a falling knife i mean there could be companies like ibm for example that are just yeah. falling that are, are it's it's not because, because of they're broken condition. businesses they're just broken yeah so I, I i have seen people at times promote these oh they've got a huge dividend g they pay 25 mm -hmm. years 30 years they're after dropping to 115 buy 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 but you're only buying that because they have a high dividend yield they have a historical yeah. history buying but you're not really understanding so i think there's a key yeah. prospects yeah. so i think there's a key difference between the two and, and trying to find that is probably tough but that's why it's important to know what you want yeah. and what you want yeah it's uh, probably a good uh, uh point as well because for instance if i would look and take the queue only from the share price i'm heavily down on uh on alibaba yeah so i see baba as a value play uh as part of the growth stocks uh, so that my 10 percent of the portfolio that I use for non-dividend paying stocks. So I'm heavily down on that one. I think my average price is 170, 175 and trading around 115. So if I would sell that all today, I would have, I, I would really, really have like large losses, right? And uh, there's also what I'm thinking, of course, this is not for the dividends. So it is for the capital appreciation. So it should go up because otherwise uh, uh, EDGI will not be happy next year. <laughs> but also here, I saw already people selling it, right? So maybe they figured out that they don't know what they own or they bought it for the wrong reasons, maybe mm. because of influencers promoting the stock. I yeah. hope nobody bought it because I was talking about it, but I hope I was always clear and I, and, um, I will reiterate myself. I have bought them 
to put them for three years on the shelf. And I've also bought them in trenches, not all at once. So I will look back at Alibaba in 2024 to decide what, uh, yeah, to, to hopefully make my 20, 25% return because mm -hmm. otherwise I could have better put it in the S and P 500 index. So on this 10% part of my portfolio, I want to beat the index. And I've been doing so far with Google, Facebook, as an example. Uh, yeah. And actually, Alibaba is having similar patterns as uh, Facebook. I bought actually Baba, uh, Facebook on $170, and it went all the way to $115 over half a year with the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Yeah, And we have something similar here with the Chinese crackdown. Yeah, it's also governmental influence, um, also a little bit due to own stupidity. I think Baba is not entirely... Uh, um, innocent here um but you know uh, after that um, it became more silent people were used to it and the stock started to recover so i'm aiming for something similar with alibaba although i must confess um, i sold last week my alibaba shares and i bought them back on the hong kong exchange but i did this for tech lo tax loss harvesting yeah so effectively i'm now offsetting my gains in option trades to not need to pay tax. Yeah, so that's what I did. And it was funny, um, actually, yesterday I saw a movie about Monish Prabhai where they asked him, why did you sell Alibaba? And he said, tax loss harvesting. But he cannot buy back in 30 days because of American regulation and the wash sale uh, rule ruling. Yep. So he bought back in uh, Prozis to own Tencent, as an example. Huh. And Prozis was a stock we discussed last week here that uh, Martin uh, uh, owned. So Martin is... Uh, trailblazing for Monish Prabhai I uh, I see here <laughs> but um, yeah for me it's as well it's a learning because um, I spent way more on Alibaba than I did on Facebook and it has to do with the fact that my portfolio it's much larger now so 10% of my portfolio three four years ago is not the same as 10% now and yeah. I think I, I invested like 3% of the portfolio so it's a larger volume yeah, but I'm looking forward to to see what it made, did me in 2024. That is my ultimate goal uh, here. Yeah, yeah, it, it seems to be heavily influenced by media, as you're saying. It's it's everywhere. The Chinese crackdown. There's talks of these VIEs being taken off the exchanges, and there's a, there's a whole yeah. lot of fear there. So you can understand. And, and as you said, lots of people are selling. I, I believe personally, lots of people want to make a quick book. So yeah. they, they, they see it a dip and they think it's going to rebound, which mm -hmm. which it did temporarily. It, it, it bounced back yeah. up. But, but there's been a falling knife so far. That, yeah. That's what I can say. Yeah. There's 100% of risk associated to that. And as you said, I hope nobody buys stocks based on us because our financial knowledge is a hobby and pub talk, not not to, exactly. be, not to be used to make your own decisions. Yeah. Um, But I, I'll give you my last reflection of the year and it's it's very personal to me it's something that I, I probably suffer with a lot and that's greed right you 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 want to make you want to make more quicker i have i have a goal i want to retire in 10 years but really really that's on papers 10 years i want to go for five and sometimes that can that can lead you to make decisions where uh, you are finding something easy at the time so i'm, I'm talking specifically on option trading i i've i I'm looking at my option summary on a monthly basis and I can see the projection is going up and up. I've, I think I've made over four and a half thousand dollars this year um, and each month it seems to be creeping up more and more. What that does is, um, they are, okay, this is easy. I, I, I just need to buy more companies. We spoke, we had an episode, was it three or four episodes? What we do when the market tanks or crashes or something. And I said how my, my feelings were different based on the option trading and the dividend growth trading and part of that was because i overextended myself i bought a visa i sold puts on visa and i sold puts on alibaba these are this means i had a huge amount of cash that i needed to have sitting there in my account in case something happens um and honestly that risk kind of scared me a little bit so on paper i had a risk wrote down yeah if the tanks i have that money there but then the talk came into my head uh, do I really want to spend 40,000 on these two companies? Probably not. So luckily, Visa came back. I got out of that. I think I made about $30, $40, but I came out of that because of the risk. I just said, I, I can't stay in both. I'm still in Alibaba. But it was just pure greed on my behalf. I, I've I've done this before. I've done it when I was back in my, my trading days. Um, and it, it pops up, but I'm just, 
glad it comes up as a reminder every now and again because it lets me to refocus. I haven't lost any money, thankfully. And I, I have wrote it down as my learnings. I'll read that now at the start of the year, write it down on my goals and realign myself. But I think greed, we, we, we see this op option trading is not easy. I mean, it's it's kind of the buzz thing at the moment. Lots of people are doing it. Lots of people are talking about it. It's it's not easy. Stuff can go wrong. I'm holding some fairly shit companies like Wish, for example. I'm still holding. So it's it's not certainly not a get rich quick investment. So what thing. I would recommend you to do, the computer where you're sitting behind now, above yeah. it is probably a white wall. Yes. Take a take a black marker which you can't erase and just write something down like, "Don't let greed." define my portfolio yes yes uh, yeah so i saw alibaba 20 what was a 20 dollars premium like oh lovely okay yeah but uh, honestly it was i was focused on premium if i have to be honest with myself i was focused on the premium i did not do my the same diligence i did with all the other yeah. other ones i didn't look i was just looking at the money and i said yeah. i did bounce back and make a quick four or five hundred that's not the case they tank further but i mean it's it's still an important lesson for me yeah super and thanks for sharing by the way i don't uh, hear too often that people are also sharing these kinds of thoughts right and uh, yeah yeah i mean we're kind of respond like we're responsible because we we talk out in public and yeah. I, I i don't think you can always give a rosy picture of, of exactly. everything i'm not a perfect investor i've, I've made a, a no. load of mistakes and option trading is is new I, i'm quite clear that i'm very very new in this i'm learning and dipping the toes in yeah. but as with everything as you get a little bit more comfortable you start to think it's easy yeah, exactly <laughs> and, but it and, isn't yeah. but you have to, you have to learn and that's i think it's important yeah that especially anyone that's new into this it's the need to understand it's yeah. not easy and you can lose far more than what you expect yeah uh, good one yeah i've got one more last learning maybe probably worth to share and um it is something that I know, but it really became apparent to me uh, this year. Also, when we had Ian Lopuk on the um, on the on the show, and yeah. I think that every dividend investor has kind of a social or mental issue. Yeah, <laughs> and and yeah, I think so. And I realized this in myself as well. I'm probably a bit more <laughs> introvert um, because we are not wired the same as other people. Mm. Yeah, uh, because, okay, you spoke just a bit about greed, but how is it possible that we get happy when the share price tanks? Like, yes. like you see people panicking, you know, in the, in, the, in the financial crisis, people are jumping even off a building and we see it as a buying opportunity when this happens. This is not normal, I think. If you, if you, if, if, no, if we are on the other side of the normal distribution and the outliers, right? <laughs> so there must be something wrong with us. And I think there is. Because, um, for instance, myself, when Ian Lopuk said, like, it's like cheating the system, this is honestly what I feel really strongly, like with the pensions, like not having been re-indexed in the Netherlands for a decade, people getting almost 20% less uh, uh, earnings power compared to what was promised to them. And if I look around me, everyone just continues to save money, uh, put it in the house, and then hope that when the debts get repaid or something like that, that that's it. The debts give them retirement. Then they need to ask, so will you sell your house at 67 or 65? Say, no, no, no. I will get retirement. I will get a pension. Yeah. So you need to be really skeptical, I guess, like myself as well, towards the future. You, you're swimming against the stream constant, constantly. And I think that means there is something wrong with me. And then when I look at the dividend investing community, I think like, yeah, we're all a bit awkward uh, because it's not normal to to have such an investment style, investing style. Yeah. So that's one of my reflections for this year. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 funny. It's it's probably true. I, I think I'm a natural int introvert as well. But what I also find funny and, and Ian's comment stuck with us a lot when he said it's like cheating the system. But you know what? It's 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 not right because if you look at, at history, right? You just go through, read books. You can see that dividends have a huge impact on total return, as in it's the majority of the total return. Yeah. So for me, it's it's all there, staring all those investors in the face. I think it goes back to to my previous point: of greed. People want to make as much as yeah. as they can, as fast as they can, and and take more risks. But I I personally think right that. If you look back in history and you see, right, you see how how dividends have shaped how much it, it works, right? It's proven mm. to work. For me, it's like going into an open book exam, 
and closing the book. That yeah. that's what I, that's what I feel like. I mean, yeah. this works time and time again. It's proven to work long term. You just have to have a long term perspective, and I think that's where people get caught. They have a short term. They they think they have a long term perspective, but six weeks is not long term. So are you saying that the normal people are actually awkward and uh, having a problem? Yes, I think so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, it, it, you sound like the movie from A Beautiful Mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah, where, where he thought he, everything was normal, but actually he was living in this world that nobody, uh, which was not true. He, 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 what did he had? Schizophrenia or something like that, right? Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, Time will tell. <laughs> Maybe I wake up one day and I see that I'm in, uh, I'm, and I start looking around me and I see them actually part of such a uh, institution, which is like one flew over the cuckoo's nest with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> I was, I was spinning top beside me like Inception, so I know. Yeah, I know exactly, what I exactly. Too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. I mean, uh, some, some, some good insights from I think from both of us there. It's been, I think been on this journey uh, certainly having a podcast has, has has helped i don't know if i would have learned as much as quick without this. I, wouldn't. I wouldn't um so i think it, this has been a blessing but we've got some some feedback from our listeners that that we like to share i think our community is, is growing our engagement is going up we get lots of messages personally and mm -hmm. also together on, on all our platforms so i think we we do appreciate it and some of the feedback we get is is quite heartwarming and nice but we'll, we'll, i'll let you start with, with some that we've, we've got yeah so so um jeffrey met from facebook um so i asked like what are your main learnings from the year as well to 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 bounce it off a little bit on the podcast also for the other listeners and him he, he's from the us i believe um and he mentioned like that his main learning was to diversify also stocks outside of the us yeah and uh for instance companies that came to his uh um, attention are ahold and danone as an example i think ahold must have done him really well danone not because it has been like that wood for a year i also have several times already people requesting about a new video on it a new update so that's something definitely i'll try to do in q1 um yeah but i think it's um it's really nice to hear this because it's also one of the reasons why we started this podcast right to yeah. to give a different sound bite into the community because yeah. everything is around the us list and everything and um we even got some feedback over the year uh, someone mentioning like guys you stopped talking about european stocks because we had like two three shows after each other where we were talking a lot about intel and such yeah it was a good recall because that's why we started to one give more uh i said um airtime to european stocks as they deserve and second like second also this european flavor on top of it because yeah. tax and everything makes it different right so thanks so, uh jeff for this really and you want to know an interesting fact so we are we are european based we have a huge european following but our number one uh, geographic area yeah. is us of a i think it's 25 percent of our listeners yeah. and it, i mean it's really it's really nice we get lots of comments where they say you've opened us up into european markets and, and european companies and I, I think that's yeah. i think that's job done for us because that's that's what we yeah want. it's an honor to hear that's this yeah it was one of our key goals so wh why continue right <laughs> no, i'm kidding um the next uh next uh, topic also from uh, facebook uh, dividend talk group is from philip uh, gamito um he had two terms of feedback and uh, first of all um uh, what he learned from us is to really pay attention to the fundamentals rather than the the noise and we just spoke a little bit about that but also to be consistent check the reports and check if management delivers year over year and i think this is really important uh, you mentioned already know what you own but also do your own homework and this mm. this is really easy to say do your own own homework but it's really hard to, to actually do it because it it you can't really do it without educating yourself in this so i believe that we have a really nice series of podcasts in here where we're talking about how to read the balance sheet how to look at the cash flow yeah. system we analyze few stocks uh, for the users as well to, to share our thoughts so i hope we we are delivering on this i think we should also still do one on the income statement and some yeah. other other areas really to help self-educating uh, uh, our listeners but then the uh, recommendations really do your own homework and and it 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 is so easy to cancel out some stocks 
that that people shouldn't own the, the the second part of him was to say like we talk a lot about shell why don't we talk so much about total energies yeah and uh, i mean he's, he's got a point we do we do focus on, on shell quite a bit but we both own shell right we, we mm. both own shell yeah. i don't own total and i don't want to be fake and, and sit here and say uh, buy total and and, and speak yeah. about them the same way shell because i don't personally own them i'm giving you my journey and they resonate with me it it doesn't mean they're the only company in that space and and actually we said it earlier if you were to pick any company in the oil and gas space last year you would have made great returns this year yeah. so we speak on shell but that's that's who, who i personally yeah. own in my portfolio and that's why i speak about them a little bit more but but you're and right so, to, total is a, is a great choice and i know european dj has has covered that before yes and i actually think that if you look at the future total energies is in my opinion the best energy stock uh, positioned for the future they've really embraced uh, climate change the transition they have already modeled their portfolio their holdings their assets towards it and i'm actually selling put options on total already for half a year and earning some money with it because i just would like to own this stock hmm. so i until then i continue to sell put options but as soon as they get triggered i'll buy them i'll get them assigned and i'll sell my exxon mobile position yeah so and then that's I and, and then we talk automatically more on it exactly but yeah. philip is right we should talk a little bit more about total energies because it's amazing amazing transformation story and i think the ceos here and the board they really deserve a lot of credits for their courage although i know it's also pushed a lot by their shareholders and regulations right still doing that i think is uh they're they're leading their their role modeling for the energy sector yeah Pinto has given some uh, some feedback, which is I think it's more aimed at you. It's it's when you are bashing CEOs, it's always quite entertaining to hear. I mean, what was it, John John Stinky? Is that is that John the name? Stinky, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I look. It's not like I have a vendetta, right? But I think really simple. These guys are on the top of the world, really large influence, get a lot of money, and when I see them that they abuse their power by for instance handing over to themselves more money and you and we can look this up right so it's good that regulation has our cover as our covered and but then also they promise things and they they do promise when they when they um make statements around the dividend and will continue to pay dividends and and i know they they put like we aim to continue but then like two months later they uh, do a spin-off and they cut the dividend hmm. uh, i think they deserve to be uh to be bashed yeah the, uh, i have no mercy from that point of view they might be the the nicest uncle but i can't even imagine that they are a nice uncle yeah i just can't so why not call them out yeah, yeah I, think, I, mean... I think they need to be called out we can't let them get away with uh with, with, with this kind of uh, self-enrichment and 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 not it's about not respecting the shareholder even the little shareholders and i think we should stand up for that um yeah we just Simple want like honesty that. honesty and transparency honesty yeah if they tell us guys uh, the market is difficult we made some uh, uh, we're suffering from past acquisitions yeah um hence we want to preserve cash going forward it's a total different story yeah mm -hmm. but the self reflection is missing it's totally missing yeah with some of the ceos yeah okay and, and just to finish up this this little mini segment we we have quite a few comments or people have said that they love our passion and it's always good to see that it can be a fun hobby as well as a serious goal for retirement lots of people saying thanks they tune in every each and every week it's, it's quite it's quite heartwarming heartwarming and i'm glad our passion comes true because i mean that's why we started this right we, exactly. we, were both, we were both passionate about dividend growth investing and we wanted to put a european voice out there so i'm, I'm glad that comes true and i'm glad that we can make it a little bit fun and people seem to seem to like that definitely definitely which also i think brings us towards the end of the show um mm. here i would like to just thank you a lot uh emf for yeah. another what is it 50 or so episodes i yeah. think we're going towards the 100 in 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 in, in the next half year so that will yeah. be a major milestone I learned a lot from you. Um, I really got, I really got a lot of. Um, I said, 
like these little things, right? Uh, where you might not even say something, but where I can just copy your behavior. Um, and that's how I learn a lot as well. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and so I'll let you speak, but I also want to thank all the guests that came to our show. Yes. Yep. I mean, we had a long list here uh, and I think we should even do more because they add so much value to the podcast. Yeah, we have, we had, we had, we had some, some guests. Maybe the standout guest was probably in, in Lopak in, in terms of stature. He's, he's probably the most well known. But we've, we've had guys like, like David on, Wolf of Harco Street, David and Atlees. Uh, the kind of capitalist came on talking about small cap stocks. I mean, we've had a, a wide range. Uh, Russ was on talking about small cap dividend stocks. So we can't thank all these guys enough for, for coming on, giving up their time and, and talking to, to each of us. Um, to all our listeners who, who stick with us, we know our episodes are long. We try to shorten them sometimes, but we, we, we just can't. We, we, we enjoy talking too much. Um, so thanks a million for sticking around, listening to all our, all our episodes. And I would like to wish everyone a nice, happy and safe Christmas. And hopefully we will talk to you soon in the, in the new year. Merry Christmas, everybody. Ho, ho, ho. See you on the outside.